you want to know who is your father and your mother, but uh, it is even more important to know who was your father and your mother 20,000 years ago. Falcomonica is a UNESCO World Heritage Site in the Lombardy region of northern Italy. In a valley spanning 70 kilometres, there are more than 150,000 individual images of rock art, known locally as Pitotti. Pitotti is a local dialect word which means slightly crazy, but also little puppet. And it is actually used for the graffitis, the little engravings that have been hacked into the rocks of this valley in the Alps. Archaeologists studying Falcomonica rock art were excited about the opportunities that 3D scanning technology could offer. What the 3D Pitotti project can give to all the people is the possibility to visit the rocks, like to be there, but in a museum. The 3D Pitotti was, uh, was great in investigating this third dimension as a new way of getting knowledge from this ancient form of art, but also creating different opportunities for the people to see and, 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 and I could say also to touch. This 3D imaging, 3D reconstruction really helps you to understand how the rock art fits into the landscape of the valley. We can recognize so high details into the what we call the packing style that will give us uh, information that was absolutely not imaginable uh, until a few years ago. As the Pitotti are in the open air, they are exposed to the harsh elements and in danger of weathering and being lost. Here is the ploughing scene. Also, the valley is in a remote area and quite hard to access, so there is some concern that these hidden treasures, which could unlock much of our lost heritage, are not widely known about or preserved well enough. With digital capture, we have the opportunity to take the rock art to new audiences, as well as giving scientists tools to conduct more detailed analysis. There's a very low contrast. We can improve that by lighting it virtually. The 3D Pitotti project involves a team of leading experts across Europe who specialize in development and use of 3D scanning, data analysis and 3D visualization technologies. Working together with archaeologists, this team of experts from academia and industry set out to establish a data pipeline from 3D digital capture of the rock art through to visual presentation. To do this, we have created a number of innovative tools and methodologies which enable detailed capture of rock art at multiple scales, semi-automated classification of rock art images, and presentation of Valcomonica rock art using interactive visual displays suitable for different audiences such as scientists, school children and museum visitors. Here we are on site in Valcomonica. Partners from Graz University of Technology and the University of Cambridge set up a combination of traditional archaeological survey equipment and custom-made scanning equipment. So what you see here is Seradina 12, uh, a huge rock with a lot of engravings on it. And what the project does is to record this at multiple scales. So first step is setting up the total station and knowing about the geo coordinates for the total station. What's very important about the total station is firstly that it's absolutely level and secondly that we know where in three-dimensional space it is. Now having roughly leveled it this way, we put the actual instrument onto the tribrack to georeference everything before the project started working here. These ground control points were hammered into the ground. We have four of them here. And Giovanna just puts the pole with the prism in the hole in the center of one of these ground control points. There are crosshairs just like on a rifle scope or whatever on here. And then we hit all and that's recorded the first point. And once we have that, the total station knows precisely in georeference coordinates where it is then we can start measuring the individual other things. We at Graz University of Technology have developed a completely novel scanning method which reconstructs the geometry of the scene 
as well as the radiometry, the color of the rock, in unprecedented quality. These four small ground control reference points are the only things permanently installed at the site. Other targets you see here are placed just for a specific purpose. The big ones here are to be recognized by unmanned aerial vehicles. In the same sense, the total station is then used to reference the individual images of our scanner here. If you look in detail, there's a small micro prism mounted to the scanner. The positions of this prism are also measured by the total station. So that finally we have the small scale, the mid scale and the large scale all referenced in one geo-referenced coordinate system. The scanner has been designed to be portable enough to be easily carried to inaccessible areas and even breaks down for storage and shipping. This is the core part of the scanner with its legs detached so that it can travel in a box. In fact, it can reconstruct surface points at 0.1 mm in spatial resolution, which is perfect for the use case of archaeology here. And it can reconstruct, in terms of radiometry, it can reconstruct surface color beyond simple photo texture. In principle, the three major components of the scanner that are needed to do the reconstruction are these custom illumination boards, two cameras, and the third part is this prism. Uh, the rest is power supply, electronics and control that has been customly designed, but uh, so these, these three things are the most important parts. The illumination, for each of the cameras you see one board here, and all these tiny little dots are high power white LEDs. The flash actually uh, is about double the intensity of the sun in Central Europe during summertime uh, at lunchtime. How do we achieve this enormous amount of light, this intense flash, just by very brief flashing of the LEDs? Because if we would uh, do that in constant firing, they would just burn through. It requires a lot of energy and a lot of current uh, to get this amount of light out of them. So they need to be pulsed and synchronized with the shutters of the two cameras to get these very high intensity images. What the scanner takes is two pictures, one picture of the ambient illumination and one picture with flash on. Next step, by subtracting these two images, in principle you have to linearize and so on, some tricks, but in principle by subtracting these two images uh, you get the true radiometry of the surface and then when it's reconstructed and mapped in this way for visualization you can artificially illuminate it with any light source uh, without cast shadows and other problems which are normally quite common for photo texturing objects. That's the main parts of the acquisition process with this scanner. To give a wider context, we also scanned the rock art at different levels of distance from the rock surface. For mid-range scanning, Graz University of Technology used unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, and micro-aerial vehicles, MAVs. For this mid-level reconstruction, we're going to use an octocopter. With this, we're going to fly and take pictures of the rock and the georeferenced markers, so then we can get a metric 3D reconstruction, which is consistent with the micro level from the scanner as well as the macro level with the hand glider. So the octocopter has these eight rotors and it also has a GPS station which it uses to stabilize itself here in the front. You can see the camera and that's also controllable to get the right viewing angle. In this camera we got a Wi-Fi transmitter which sends the data back down to the notebook and we can then assess if we have to take more pictures or from different viewing angle and this will be uh, done autonomously. So we just send the UAV, okay, take a picture from over there and it will do that. And then we can confirm if this is enough for the reconstruction or not. So here you can see the, uh, the images transmitted down from the MAV together with GPS data, um, which means that you can directly get a metrical 3D reconstruction on site during the flight which you can see here and it grows and grows and the more points you get the more accurate you become and at some point you can just start and evaluate if what you have got already covered and if you want some region more than that so you can just select one of the pitotti here 
and evaluate whether or not the quality of this pitotti now is sufficient for what you are planning. You see here the visualization of the 3D reconstruction and how this is done actually is called structure from motion which means that you get images, find correspondences between those images and then you can interpolate in 3D where the point actually lies. For this you don't actually need markers or GPS or anything, it works without that, but you don't get any scale, so it's not magical. For this you either you need some metrical information which you can either get for example by GPS measurements or more accurately the markers. And <clears throat> our system can actually use both online and therefore um, it's quite flexible in the way of use and you can even take images while the markers are not yet measured. Here you can see the images and they are aligned and also the scene itself is reconstructed which means you see observe the scene from different viewing angles and therefore you can decide where the points you match in the images actually lie in 3D and <coughs> here you can see also a mesh reconstruction which then tells you more about the scene so the points are quite sparse and the human cannot really interpret a lot with it but in a mesh representation here, over here you can see the structure of the rock itself and we can use this structure to determine whether or not there are self-occlusions and we have to take pictures from different viewing angles to get a seamless 3D reconstruction. And over here you can see the system in, in the part are marked over here in the image here. I told the system whether or not this uh, reconstruction is uh, sufficient in this part and it just tells me okay here over here there is obviously a hole and you have to take close-ups or maybe images from a different viewing angle to get a good and seamless 3D reconstruction here. To capture the widest view, 3D Prototti partners Arctron 3D flew a micro light aircraft over the valley to gather data. UAVs were also used to gather macro level data. So what we are trying to do is, in, in addition to the scans on the micro level and the UAV flying on the mid level, we also want to have the largest level, so the, the, the whole context, which means we want to have a reconstruction of the area around these sides of the whole valley at the best case. What we're actually using is a plane that actually glides through the air and can cover larger areas with uh, a lower amount of, of, of battery and it can fly uh, for a much longer time and this is perfect for this large-scale uh, mapping of, of, of an area and we are using a very small portable plane which comes in this box and we will try to reconstruct the part of the valley which also the other rock where the UV was flying is in so that we can put the UV reconstruction in context of the, the area around it. We need a linear uh, area to, to take off for the UV to, to gain some height and also for the landing coming in and this is now perfect. I mean, we have some power lines back there, but they are much lower than we are going to fly. So here, uh, at the back of this hill here, there should be the, the, the area where the UV was flying. The camera is in here. It's an, it's an ordinary consumer camera, actually, one that you can buy. So it's connected here to the EB. Apart from that, it's, it's, it's completely standard. It's a 12 megapixel camera. It has a, a memory card in it, fairly standard. And the power pack is here. So you have these small power packs and it can fly about 40 to 45 minutes with one power pack and you can cover areas of like 50 hectares or something, not a problem. You can launch it by switching it on and then just throwing it away and then it will fly totally autonomously. And so I will switch it on now. We have to wait until the light is green. And once the light is green, we can just launch it. And then it takes off. Now it's a gaining height, it's going to a so-called home waypoint where it will circle and ascend to 90 meters above ground. We can go back to the computer so that if in case it shows some problems. This is the security radius. Once it would technically reach this radius, which it won't, it would automatically come back to us. And here we can monitor and give it some commands. We can see what the wind is, we can see its height. It's currently 190 meters above where we started. In principle, it's quite accurate. Regarding that it's very small or lightweight and doesn't have that many expensive sensors on it, I guess. 
The computer shows us where the UAV is in terms of this red uh, plane and it shows us this flight pattern, these lines here and every time it makes this clicking noise and it places a, a small red cross onto the monitor it, it tells us that a picture has been taken. Now it's actually coming back to us to, to measure the wind above us and to prepare for landing. So the mission is done. It has taken uh, 120 images in both runs and we will later use these images to can generate a 3D model that we can then align with the model that we already saw from the UV and the scanner. What you have to do first actually is you give it a flight plan. So the plane is not then like intelligent robots that it, it just has a flight plan based on GPS coordinates. It just steers and then it triggers the camera whenever it reaches a certain waypoint. So what you have to do first if you have to look at your map on your computer you have to select the rectangular area uh, more or less the, the area that you want to survey that you want to uh, reconstruct and when you have this area, the, the calculation of like when to take the pictures is done by the software. So the, the, you, you just say what is your desired quality in terms of what is the ground sampling distance, so how many centimeters per pixel, depending on, on what camera you have. And if this is known, then the program can calculate the grid and also its flight lines based on its own capabilities. So can it make this turn or not? Then you can also incorporate the elevation data from satellites so that you have the heights so that you can, uh, that it can keep a constant distance from the ground. And once it has that, you can upload it. And once this is uploaded, technically you could close your computer. But of course you want to keep the contact and you can, in case you want to change something or in case you encounter some problems. But it basically it's, it's, it's in a way autonomous based on the programming, but it, it, it is not like a, a, a UV with the view planning that in, in a sense it, it sees because it doesn't really see anything. It just flies based on the GPS. This whole plane, including the software, is actually something anybody can buy. So that's from the, that's from a company from Switzerland and they have engineered the, the plane, including the software. And there's also a 3D reconstruction pipeline included, which you can more or less just start with one click and you automatically get a, a, a nice 3D reconstruction, either a point cloud or a mesh geo-referenced already because you have the GPS coordinates of the, of the images. You can fly like at the same time where the others are scanning or at the same day where this, the, ground, uh, the total station and so on is, is placed. And you can use the markers for geo-referencing because in principle it also just takes images the same as the scanner, the same as the UV. So what you do with the images is up to you. But you can of course uh, include and use the GPS coordinates for alignment and maybe afterward to do some refinement in case it's not enough. But for, for the, I guess for the, for the most cases uh, the GPS would be fine and then you already have the large scale and then you just have to map your mid-range and, and detailed scans onto this large scale map. Scanning generates a huge amount of raw data. 3D Pitotti partners from St. Poulton University of Applied Sciences together with Arctron 3D develop tools for semi-automated processing of the data. We are getting involved right after the scanning is finished um, on site. We will take the pictures and do the offline processing. So we are using SFM algorithms to create a dense point cloud and a mesh. And afterwards we store the results in the database. And we um, work with these data in the database with the guys from the segmentation. Based on this high quality 3D data, we follow the classic way of documenting rock art and also go beyond because the data we have is high resolution, very good quality, 0.1 millimeters and uh, below. And like the first step in the archaeological documentation process is to document the shape and the position of the figures on the rock surface. Normally you put a foil on it, some transparent material and you paint it pack by pack and lots of square meters, long time. And we have a tool which helps you doing this. It makes an automatic suggestion which part of the surface is packed and which part of the surface is natural. And you can refine that in the next step. So this is an important step because it really speeds up the process. And then, based on this, we have tools that support the automated typing of the figures. So you have then the mask of a figure, and then you can automatically find out if it's a deer, a horse, a human. I mean, you might ask yourself, I can also type it uh, fast, but we have a large amount of figures. It's more than 300,000 there in the valley. And if you have suggestions that you can accept or decline, then you're way faster in uh, typing. And the third thing we are doing uh, is that we investigate the peg styles themselves. So how deep are the peg styles, coarse, fine. We take a surface patch and 
our algorithms make a numeric description of the surface patch and we can then compare surface patches to each other. So you would ask the system, I have this patch, this packed surface patch, tell me where in my database are surface patches that are similar to this surface patch so that you can find patterns of the surface in your whole database. And I learned that it's an important thing because still it's always it's the sheer amount of data. You think there was somewhere a scene with a hunter and some deer and with our tools you can find them way faster than before. The team created a database implementing a hierarchical structure to group images into elements, figures and scenes. We have that hierarchy to work on. For example here we have a human figure and this has already been segmented not only by the algorithm but by user as well. On the right hand side um, the archaeological description is present to give the guy a name, uh, to have the discovery date, the cultural period, um, to which figures and composition it belongs to, and um, the wider context, so to speak, of um, the Pitotti. The figure itself is fully georeferenced. That means um, even though this human figure is just about 50 mm in height, it has the exact coordinates um, and can be found anywhere in the world. The data are used in different ways for presentation to different audiences. The Virtual Reality Systems Group, Bauhaus University Weimar, invented a variety of new tools and built the 3D Pitotti Scientists Lab. The University of Cambridge produced a 3D film designed to extend the reach of the results to a wider audience. The University of Nottingham, together with Archeo Communi, developed a mobile app to allow children to create their own stories about rock art. Then the barbarian came, treating animals like dirt and swearing to attack them. So we have an overview of the project, plus a video on scanning, processing and presentation tools. We've created tools that allow you to have two different views. The create part allows you to create your own stories about the rock art. We use augmented reality markers. We chose these markers because they're very clear and you're able to just print them out. And you can arrange them around your classroom and in your home. You can move your clips to the timeline and then create your own story about the rock art. Today we've come to Archeo Communi to demonstrate a prototype of the 3D Pitotti mobile app. Now with this technology that we have, this is a new chance that we have to work with the teacher so that they will have a new tool to, uh, to use in the classroom especially because what we saw that is very useful is once they're back in the classroom. So I teach history of music and I do something like this but not interactive. I would like to have some like this in, for music too. 3D Pitotti project partners CCSP are using the storytelling app and other project presentation material in their museum education centre in Valcamonica. Events allowed us to bring the Pitotti to a wider European audience. The mobile storytelling app, together with high quality 3D prints, brought the rock art to life. The 3D Pitotti Scientist Lab in Weimar, Germany, allows archaeologists to discuss and debate the Pitotti under laboratory conditions. This cutting-edge lab consists of a multi-viewer power wall, which allows up to six people to each have a unique 3D perspective on a shared scene. Features include use of innovative tools such as virtual torches, depth maps and photo portals. I focused on this area here where the scratch runs through the antler. If we want to use these systems to look at the data, then this should be a collaborative experience because otherwise you look at the data, but if you cannot communicate about it, it doesn't make much sense. And you should be able to, to see where I'm pointing, what I'm pointing, where I'm tracing. Also in the lab is a 3D multi-viewer interactive touch table. So we need to have proper navigation techniques that allow us to move from, from the various ends of the valley to walk across these rocks and even zoom in to the various scale levels. We start to see the peg marks, which obviously cannot be done in original scale like this without having some magnifiers or so. This unique device works in conjunction with the power wall to enable archaeologists to collaboratively debate the creation 
and potential meaning of the patotti. Of the flag is slightly twisted, but if you are looking from the angle as it is on the rock, yes. you're absolutely perfect. And that's what I think we see here. The 3D Patotti Scientist Lab was perceived by archaeologists as a real step change in presentation and analysis of rock art data. So this ends our tour of Virtual Wacomonica. To find out more about the 3D Pitotti project, please visit our website. <laughs>